So uh, last time we discussed setting the metric equal to flat space with a small perturbation. And then we studied the equations for that small perturbation. And uh, as I mentioned before, that perturbation represents gravitational waves, which are distortions in uh, the metric uh, that travel at the, speed of, uh, at the speed of light. So we picked a gauge or coordinates. Uh, a harmonic gauge, and uh, when you work this out to first order in H, it looks like this. Um, but so that's four. Um, four gauge conditions, or coordinate conditions. And as I explained, it doesn't fully fix the coordinates. It still leaves some residual coordinate freedom. So I can still uh, change coordinates, provided I, um, I leave that, uh, that condition unchanged, the gauge condition unchanged. And so what we, then we discovered that the Einstein equations, in uh, the absence of matter, these become box uh, h mu nu equals zero in this gauge. And so the solution was sum over, and let's just uh, write it out um, in this way. It's a sum over wave numbers, k, this equation here becomes the condition uh, k naught squared equals k squared. And uh, so I can write the solution in the following way. Um, epsilon mu nu of k. This is the uh, spatial wave number times e to the i uh, k dot x. And if you ask, what is this exponent, if we write it out explicitly, it's the magnitude of k times t minus k dot x. Uh, the energy, uh, this, or the this sort of uh, k naught component, uh, uh, has to be k naught squared equals k squared. Okay, so this is the uh, general solution of the... Uh, the wave equation. It's a linear, so the way to think about it is I uh, first um, Fourier transform with respect to space. Okay, so this is equal to e to the i mod k t minus k dot x. So I first Fourier transform with respect to space, and then I discover that the Fourier modes evolve um, harmonically. In other words, it's e to the i k t, uh, with time. So these are plane waves, of course, and we can have um, we can have waves just as we did with light. We can have waves waves which look like um, epsilon mu nu as a function of let's say x minus uh, c t. Um, with, with some appropriate conditions, with various conditions on these epsilon mu nu, which we'll study. But basically, this is a tensor function, which is uh, traveling along as a wave, and that will satisfy the wave equation. And then we have to think carefully, what does this condition mean for that function? And, and can I, do I have any other coordinate freedom? What we'll discover is that using the gauge condition and coordinate freedom. Um, if the wave is traveling in the uh, x direction, then, uh, then epsilon 
mu nu uh, must be transverse. Transverse to the wave, uh, i.e., if a uh, wave travels in the z direction, the only non zero components components are epsilon x x, epsilon x y, epsilon y y. Um, and when I say the only non-zero components, what I really mean is you can pick a gauge in which gauge in which the only non-zero components. So basically this epsilon is, you know, you can change it with coordinate transformations. But uh, what I'll show you is that you can pick your coordinates so that the wave's going along in one direction, and the only non-zero components of the gravitational wave are in the perpendicular directions. Um, and that's why we call it a transverse wave. Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's show that. Um, so I've got my uh, h mu nu equals to a sum of epsilon mu nu, mu nu. These are constants. They just depend on k. So let's write them as functions of k, e to the i k dot x. Uh, so k, this is a space time dot e to the i k dot x plus complex conjugate because the metric is supposed to be real. Um, and uh, that solves the um, Einstein equations. And the, the gauge condition reads, um, gauge condition reads k mu epsilon um, mu nu. nu. K mu epsilon mu nu minus a half K nu epsilon nu mu equals zero. Okay, so that's obvious from there. The, the partial d by dx lambdas just turn into Ks because of the Fourier transform. Um, and now, um, uh, as, I, as I explained, I'm still free. Mm, probably. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> mu, mu, mu. Thank you. Uh, I mean, otherwise they can't. Uh, there's, <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, yes, you're right. There's a, you're right. There's a new, yeah. Yep, thanks. Okay, the free index is the new. Okay, so um, we are still free. To change uh, coordinates, <coughs> and um, as long as we respect, as long as we, as we maintain the gauge condition, okay, so you'll remember that when I change coordinates, h mu nu goes to h prime mu nu, which is h mu nu minus epsilon mu comma nu minus epsilon nu comma mu, where epsilon nu is any four vector function of space time. So this generalizes the gauge transformations in Maxwell's theory. And in particular, you see, I'd like the h prime mu nu still to satisfy box h mu nu equals zero. So the easy way to do that is to have epsilon or it's itself be a sum. So uh, in particular, uh, if epsilon mu of x is a sum, and I'm going to just 
change from epsilon to C, so we get less confused. Epsilon mu nu has nothing to do with epsilon mu nu here, right? These are uh, for vectors. This is a tensor. So I'm going to choose the expansion coefficient to be C. I'm going to put an I here just to make uh, the equations a little nicer. Um, e to the I K X plus complex conjugate. So if epsilon mu is equal to this, where C mu is a function of uh, K. And again, if you think about it carefully, C mu, C mu is only a function of the spatial K, uh, because the K naught is given uh, implicitly by K naught equals modulus K. Okay, so that's going to be my coordinate transformation. And when I make this coordinate transformation on H, you can see from here and here that all that's going to happen is I'm going to change my epsilon tensor by something involving C. Okay, so this has the effect that epsilon mu nu goes to epsilon mu nu prime, which is epsilon mu nu plus, um, you see when I differentiate, I'm going to get an i k nu, and then that i multiplied this i will give a minus sign, and that'll cancel that minus sign. So I'll get epsilon k mu c nu plus k nu c mu. Okay, so coordinate transformations where, which themselves obey the wave equation um, So coordinate transformations which themselves obey the wave equation um, just have this effect of shifting the polarization tensor epsilon. And um, we can use the, such transformations. Uh, now let's see. It should be that these transformations leave the gauge condition invariant. We can check that. Okay, so uh, let's calculate the, well, let's calculate this k mu epsilon prime mu nu minus a half k nu epsilon um, mu mu prime. So the first term is zero because epsilon solved the equation. And the second term gives me um, uh, this one will just give me k squared when multiplying by this. This will give me, uh, and k squared is zero. So over here, I'll get k dot c, k nu, from this second term. And then minus here, um, k nu here, times one half. And then epsilon mu mu, I get twice k dot c. Right, so this gives zero. So uh, these type of coordinate transformations leave the gauge condition uh, preserved. Um, and so the counting is as follows, that I have on the first line of that blackboard, I've got 10 functions, h mu nu. These gauge conditions are four equations, so that subtracts four. I have six linearly independent epsilon mu nu, but I still have four arbitrary c nu's. Okay, so 10 minus four minus four gives two. So we end up with two um, linearly independent um, uh, um, entries in that uh, polarization tensor matrix, which cannot be changed by um, coordinate transformations. So let's sort of see that all explicitly. So let me just write that down. The 10 components of h mu nu 
get reduced to 6 by the gauge condition. And down to 2 by the 4 coordinate for remaining coordinate transformations. which preserve the gauge condition. Okay. Yeah. Are the things you see by the board above? Uh huh. Now you I think have you got you've got an epsilon mu nu. Yeah. You've got an epsilon mu. Uh, one no, of the, yeah, one of them's a polarization tensor, and the one other one is the transformation. Yeah, this thing from the next one is this. But then over on the right-hand side, like, you do C nu. Yes, C nu is a Fourier coefficient yep. of the coordinate mu. transformation. I'm just, I'm just trying to see where you got that down, then you're pulling out a polarization tensor on your last... This one? Like, the line below. Okay. Did that, right. Where that came from there. Okay, so... Uh, are you happy with this? We can change the polarization tensor with these Yes. Views. Fine. Now, what I'm checking below is that if I do this change, it leaves that gauge condition respected. So what I did is I plugged this formula into the gauge condition, right? And this is what it's equal to. And what you see is that... Um, if epsilon mu nu satisfies the gauge condition, then so does epsilon prime mu nu, because this extra term doesn't change anything. Right? The, ter the change in the gauge condition comes from here, but these terms precisely cancel between this one and that one. That's what happens. Okay? So epsilon prime mu nu dotted with the k. First I got a k squared, but k squared is zero. Okay? Then I got k dot c times k nu. That was this first term. And this term, I take the trace of this guy, the mu mu, and that gives me twice k dot c, and that exactly cancels. Okay, so uh, let's just do this all uh, explicitly. It's worth uh, doing. Uh, so let's pick our form momentum to be this. Okay, so this represents a gravitational wave uh, y Z, a gravitational wave traveling in the Z direction. Okay, so obviously E to the I K dot X will be um, E to the I K T, it's actually with a minus sign, right, will be E to the minus I K T uh, plus I K Z. And um, and this will this will lead to well I can write that as e to the i k z minus t, and so this represents a wave propagating in the z direction. Okay, so it's some wave-like pattern in z, and the pattern just shifts according to. Uh, by, by T, uh, as the time evolves. Okay, so that's our wave. Uh, K with downstairs indices is minus K, zero, zero, K. Um, we, let's write out explicitly this equation, K mu nu, epsilon mu nu, is one half K nu, epsilon mu mu. Uh, so for nu equals zero, we have uh, k times epsilon zero zero plus epsilon three zero equals minus a half k. Then the trace of epsilon, I have a minus sign in the zero zero component, and one one two plus epsilon three three. Uh, then I have k. So nu equals uh, 3. 
let's write this down, 0, 3 plus epsilon 3, 0 equals a plus a half k minus epsilon 0, 0 plus epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3. And then I have 1, so k times uh, epsilon 0, 1 plus epsilon 3, 1 equals 0. And 2, I have k times epsilon 0, 2 plus epsilon 3, 2 equals 0. Okay, so these are my four equations for the 10 components of epsilon. And what we see from this is epsilon 0, 1 is minus epsilon 3, 1. Epsilon 0, 2 is um, minus epsilon 3, 2. Epsilon 0, 3 is equal to minus 1 half. Epsilon 0, 0 plus epsilon 3, 3. And epsilon 2, 2 is minus epsilon 1, 1. Okay, so we've managed to uh, eliminate four components of epsilon using the four gauge conditions. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right, that's 3, 3. Thank you. Okay, now we have uh, the residual coordinate freedom. Freedom, i.e. this uh, CMU. Uh, CMU. And that gives us epsilon prime mu nu is epsilon mu nu plus k mu c nu plus k nu c mu. And so this gives us uh, epsilon zero zero prime is epsilon zero zero minus two k c zero. Um, epsilon one three prime is epsilon one three plus k c one. Epsilon two three prime is epsilon two three plus k c two. Epsilon 3, 3 prime is epsilon 3, 3 plus 2k c3. And we're free to pick c0, 1, 2, 3, uh, whatever we like to be, whatever we want them to be. So we can choose c mu so that uh, epsilon 0, 0, prime equals epsilon 1, 3 prime equals epsilon 2, 3 prime equals epsilon 3, 3 prime equals 0. Okay, so, uh, and now from these equations, um, all of these other terms are 0. So basically, this means that epsilon mu nu is a matrix, which is 0, almost everywhere, but in the 1, 2 components, it is not 0. Okay, that's all that's left. Uh, epsilon is a symmetric, symmetric matrix, so epsilon 2, 1 is the same as epsilon 1, 2. Um, and uh, epsilon 2, 2 is minus epsilon 1, 1. Okay, so we're going to actually define this to be the following. Um, epsilon plus, eps uh, and then minus epsilon plus. Uh, this is the um, polarization aligned with the 1, 1, and 2, 2 axes. And then we're going to call the other guy epsilon cross and epsilon cross because it involves both 1 and 2.
On the left hand side, I've just got is that just for the math? Or just the Sorry, math? Say, say the question. Like again. just your four equations, you know, like one, three, two, three, three, four, yeah, just zero, yeah. zero, zero, zero. I'm just reading off mu equals zero, mu equals zero in this equation. So I get zero, I get the same components here, right? And the, remember this k mu. K mu is lowered index, so it's minus k, zero, zero, k. Yeah, I, I only chose four components because there are only four of these Cs. Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, there are lots of other components, but um, these are the interesting ones. Yeah. Okay, so these ones are enough to allow me to fix the Cs by uh, eliminating all of those. Okay, so by choosing a gauge, you can always put your polarization tensor in this form. And this is called uh, transverse traceless or TT gauge. Traceless. So transverse traceless means that the only perturbations in the metric are in, with indices which are transverse to the direction the wave is moving in. And traceless, obviously the off-diagonal part is traceless. The diagonal part has to satisfy that this is minus that to be traceless. Um, now, we can also define, define um, epsilon, um, epsilon right. This would be, you see, these are linear polarizations. One, in one polarization, the H um, up and down, in the uh, H in these two components are non-zero. In the other polarization, the... Um, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll give you a picture of it later. Um, but for the moment, uh, just allow me to define epsilon right, which is epsilon 1, 1 minus I epsilon 1, 2, which is epsilon plus minus I epsilon cross. And epsilon left which is epsilon 1, 1 plus I epsilon 1, 2, which is epsilon plus plus I epsilon cross. Now, if you do rotations, so under rotations, which leave K mu fixed, Okay, so k mu is this four vector, but it has a spatial component in the z direction. Okay, now it's clear that if I do a rotation around the z direction, it doesn't change k. Okay, that's actually, that's called the little group of k. It's the subset of Lorentz transformations, which leave the four vector alone. And what we have in h mu nu is some representation of the Lorentz group, if you've, done, if you've done group theory, uh, you'll realize that, uh, you know, the h mu nu has to transform under the Lorentz group. And it's interesting to ask, how does this gravitational wave change when we do rotations um, in, these, uh, in this little group? So here's my k vector. And uh, if I do rotations about the z-axis, I'm going to transform 1 into 2. And I'm going to transform these components of h, the 1, 1 component into the 1, 1, and uh, into the 2, 2, and the 1, 2. They're all going to mix under these rotations. So, you, so it's interesting to ask, how does this polarization change if I do a rotation around the z-axis? 
So under these rotations, we have uh, epsilon pi mu nu will be cosine sine theta minus sine theta. I'm just going to do the one, two components. The, um, what, the, yeah, I guess I'll just write them down. Epsilon one, one, epsilon one, two, epsilon two, one, epsilon two, two, prime. These are given by cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, times epsilon one, one, epsilon one, two, epsilon two, one, epsilon two, two, times cosine theta, um, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, transpose. Okay, why? Because epsilon is a symmetric tensor, okay, and epsilon mu nu prime is equal to lambda um, epsilon lambda transpose. Okay, epsilon is a symmetric tensor, and so under Lorentz transformation, that's how epsilon transfer, tra um, transforms. Okay, it has two indices, they both transform with a lambda, and you remember, when we write this as a matrix, we have to transpose the, the, the second one. So you can work this out um, very easily. It's a complicated expression. But the result is that epsilon, plus, epsilon right prime, this guy defined here, is equal to e to the 2 i theta epsilon right. And epsilon left prime is equal to e to the minus 2 i theta epsilon left. OK, so there's a theorem in group theory that when you have an abelian group, like this uh, little group of the 4 vector k, that if you have something which transforms under that group, you can split the representation into block diagonal pieces. And each piece must be one dimensional. OK, the only irreducible representations of, the, uh, of an abelian group are one-dimensional, okay? And that means they're just a phase. So group theory guarantees it's going to work. And the answer is that gravitational waves have this number 2 in the exponent. Okay, and that means they are spin 2. If you did the same thing for a photon, it only has one index in the tensor here. When you do this transformation of a photon polarization vector, you just have one of these matrices here, and you'll find the two polarizations of a photon have spin one. Okay, there are only two um, um, independent degrees of freedom in the photon solution, and they have spin one. So this means that, that the graviton has spin two. Right? Likewise, if you did this for a fermion field, like a Dirac field, which I think you'll do later, you'll find the exponent is a half. When you rotate it, it only changes by e to the half i theta. That's because you don't use these Lorentz matrices at all. You use the spinner representation of the Lorentz group. Um, let's see if this has been fixed. No. So these are the um, left and right polarized, polarized gravitational waves. That's why I called them L and R. Yeah. So this thing I should, I should say circularly polarized. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Um, another way of saying it is that when I think about a gravitational... You, yeah, that's exactly right. So let's go back to electromagnetic wave. If I look at an electromagnetic wave coming at me out of the board, the electric field is a vector, right? Points in some direction. So I can 
picture this wave as being specified by the direction of this vector. This vector could point anywhere, and all those waves are different for an electromagnetic field. A gravitational wave is totally different. A gravitational wave I should think about as a headless vector. <laughs> okay? You see, when it squeezes space, um, it's squeezing it in this, in this direction, but it's both squishing it that way and squishing it this way. There's no directionality to it. Okay? So if I turn the gravitational wave upside down, it does exactly the same thing. It just squeezes it. It's coming compressing, and I turn it upside down, it's still compressing. And so this is a headless vector. Okay? And uh, a headless vector is a um, spin 2 representation of the rotation group. Um, and uh, so, yes, you should think about gravitational waves as headless uh, vectors. In fact, uh, I, I, I digress a little bit, but if you, if you, this is something I worked on a while ago, but you, you, you know about liquid crystals. Your LCD di displays are made out of liquid crystals. And what are liquid crystals? The liquid crystal is just a liquid made of uh, rod-shaped molecules. Okay, so they are just rods. Okay, like this. And, um, and they don't have a directionality. Okay, so it turns out that when you describe this, the way a liquid crystal orders, so for example, if all these rods line up, um, you have to take into account the fact that this rod is invariant under 180 degree rotations. It really doesn't have a direction. And this is crucial, in fact, to understanding the system because you can have string-like defects. You see, if you have an arrowed vector, like this, I really am digressing, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But an arrowed vector can have defects like this, where at this point, if the vector field is going to be smooth, it has to vanish. Right? That's a topological zero of the vector field. It says that if the direction of the vector field changes around 360 degrees, it just has to vanish somewhere. Okay? Whereas if I have a headless vector, there's another option, okay? which is that I, I'm not sure I can draw it. Um, I've only got a change by 180 degrees as I come around the defect. Okay, so when I come down here, it will be like this, and I guess it's going to tilt that way and that way, and here's my defect. And that is a perfectly continuous field, which has, um, have I done it right? Uh, yes, I've done it right. So as you go around, right, it changes continuously, but only 180 degrees. Oh, no. <laughs> like this, and then like that. <laughs> okay? So this is very important, because when you do make an LCD screen, you get defects. Okay? You try to line up all these liquid crystals, first thing that happens, you get these defects, and they can't be removed because they're topological. All right? And it turns out the defects are kind of half defects. And you may have heard buzzwords of Majorana fermions and all that kind of stuff, and this is uh, related to that. I won't tr attempt. I won't attempt to go there, but uh, yes, a very important point that um, gravitational waves are, are really headless vectors, which are spin two objects, not spin one. Okay, <clears throat> so um, just for fun. We did this in four dimensions. Yeah. Can you explain again why that uh, uh, tuned exponent implies it has spin two? That's the definition of spin. Definition of spin. Yeah. <laughs> Look at all the representations of the Lorentz group or the rotation group, and you find that they 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 come in half integer. Okay, it's consistency of the. Um, it comes from the commutators of the rotation group that you're forced to spin half. You know, when you did quantum mechanics, all you're really doing is group theory. And when you showed that a spin half particle 
uh, you, you, sp you showed that uh, the representation of the commutation relations, right, had to be um, Jz equals, uh, well, I guess you, you showed J equals one, uh, well, I guess zero, half, one, etc. One can show that from the commutation relations of the spin operators. And these numbers are precisely the numbers which appear in here. It's the same group, because just the rotation group. Um, of course, you're using the fact. You see, I singled out the x, y direction. If that's all I knew, I wouldn't be enough to specify that these had to be half integer. I need to know that this x, y direction is a part of the full three-dimensional rotation group. Three-dimensional rotation group is this non-abelian guy that has quantized uh, spins. So uh, that, that's where this comes from. Yeah. So you said you were taking the little group of something. What were you taking the little group of? Oh, the little group of the. So consider all the lambda mu nus, right? All the Lorentz group, which leave k mu invariant. K is the four vector. Oh, the one I've used throughout. This one. Yeah. Okay. So I pick a four vector, which is this vector going in the z direction. Of course, it includes time as well. I, I've sort of taken all, out all the time. And so when you restrict to rotations, you're just looking at rotations which leave this uh, z vector. I guess I should write it as a column equal to uh, 0, 0. K, and these, the only rotations that leave the z vector alone are rotations around the z axis, and that, that's what these ones are. Okay, so just for fun, let's think about uh, higher dimensions. Okay, so um, we in, high, in any dimension D, so uh, in, in D space-time dimensions, so H mu nu um, is a D times D matrix, and so that has a D, D plus 1 over 2 components. Right? It's a symmetric matrix. So there's D, D minus 1 over 2 off-diagonal elements for a symmetric matrix. And then it's, there's D diagonal components. And you add those two up, you get uh, D, D plus 1, because it's a symmetric. Um, and that's a lot. That's equal to 10 in, uh, in four dimensions. But then we have uh, D gauge conditions. Okay, so we get D, D plus 1 over 2 minus D. And then we have D, uh, D uh, residual uh, coordinate transformations. Coordinate transformations. And so I reduce this to uh, d, d minus 1 over 2 minus 2d. And if you work that out, that's equal to um, d squared. Let me see. d minus, that's equal to d minus 1. Sorry. That's equal to, according to me, what is that equal to? That's equal to d, d minus 3 over 2. Is that correct? Yeah, that looks right. And uh, this equals 
number of independent components of a symmetric um, uh, D minus 2 times D minus 2 matrix. Okay, why is that? Well, that would be D minus 2, D minus 3 over 2 for the diagonal elements, plus D minus 2. Uh, so, um, sorry, did I get that? Mm. Why am I getting D minus two, not D minus three? Oh, sorry, symmetric traceless. Traceless, I forgot about that. Symmetric traceless D minus one, D minus two matrix. So these are the off diagonal elements of a symmetric matrix. The diagonal elements are D minus two, but the trace is zero as well. Okay, so I actually get D minus 3, and that's exactly uh, this number. Okay, so what's that saying is that when you think about the HIJs, you can cancel off two rows and columns, or the H mu nu's. You can cancel off two rows and columns, the ones that involve the direction of the vector. You just think about the transverse directions. That's a symmetric polarization matrix and it has to be traceless. So that works in any dimension. And uh, I guess it's interesting to write down some numbers. So in, uh, in D equals two, the number of D degrees of freedom in a graviton and the number of degrees of freedom in a photon. Okay, so d equals 2. Uh, this expression here is minus, minus 1. So there's certainly no degrees of freedom in a graviton. In a photon, there are 0. Photon, number of degrees of freedom of a photon is just d minus 2. Uh, this one is d, d minus 3 over 2. In three dimensions, you have no gravitons. You have one photon polarization in three dimensions. In four, we have 2 and 2. In five, we have 5 and 3. And in ten dimensions, which some people like, there are no fewer than 35 gravitons and eight photon polarizations. Question. Yeah. What does it mean that we have minus one? It means we did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as we saw in, um, you know, you just means to go back to the beginning and you'll find that, that you made a mistake somewhere. <laughs> Not at all. Not as far as I know. But uh, having said that, <laughs> um, one shouldn't be altogether so glib. Uh, sometimes it is useful, in, uh, especially in quantum field theory, to think of the dimension d as a variable. Uh, this is done in dimensional regularization, for example. And in that case, you really are considering the uh, whatever you calculate as a function of d. And it's very useful to actually continue that argument d to unphysical values. Okay, And then you may calculate the function in that region where it's well-defined, and then get the answer as a function of d, and continue it back to the physical value. That's a method of regularization, which is very powerful. Yeah? So when you have, when you have number of residual um, 
coordinate transformations and you're taking away the second D. Yes. You should have D, D plus one. I, I started with this. Yes. I took off one D. Yes. For the gauge condition. I took off another D. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, so now let us actually look at these gravitational waves and look at what they do physically. Uh, people are looking for them now. There are these wonderful experiments like LIGO, these uh, kilometer-long kilometer interferometers. And what they're doing, as I said last time, is looking for the motion of the ends of the detector, the masses, uh, one kilometer apart. And as this gravitational wave goes through, uh, it, the, the length of the interferometer changes just because the metric changes. So uh, let, let's see how that happens. Uh, so detecting gravitational waves. Um, and there's a, there's a very nice way to see this, um, which is, if you remember, uh, we discussed the motion of two uh, particles. We call them test particles. These are particles that are just falling in a gravitational field uh, using the geodesic equation. And then we derived an equation for the separation uh, of those two world lines. Okay, so this world line has proper time tau. I can ask, what is the coordinate separation, the delta x mu, between, uh, in fact, let me just call it, I'll call it, uh, uh, yeah, this is, I'll call it delta x mu of tau, and I'm going to call that s mu of tau, the separation for vector. Um, and we calculated, we, we found an equation for delta x mu that just involved the Riemann tensor. Okay, so when you think about something like the LIGO experiment, um, uh, ignore the fact that it's being held up on the surface of the Earth. That's to do with the z direction. Imagine the LIGO detector is just two masses, okay, and they are just falling freely in space. Um, and then this gravitational wave is going to come along and move them, displace them in the x direction. So think of the two LIGO masses as these point masses, and they're just following geodesics in space-time. And as I said, of course, they're being held on the surface of the Earth, so that's like an acceleration in, in this direction, but that's perpendicular to the effect of the gravitational wave. So... Uh, these two masses obey uh, an equation, the separation vector, so the separation for vector, for vector, d2s mu d tor squared was equal to the Riemann tensor nu rho sigma u nu u rho s sigma. And so to understand the effect of the gravitational waves, all we need to do is to calculate the Riemann tensor and plug it into this equation. Now, we're going to calculate to leading order, order in h mu nu. So just a linearized theory, uh, assuming uh, u nu equals uh, 1, 0 to lowest order. That's to zeroth order. Okay, so the idea is that um, the this quantity is first order in h anyway. And so there's no need to consider anything else to first order in H, everything else is going to be considered at zeroth order uh, on the, everything else on the right-hand side. 
Okay, so uh, I'll just write that here. This is going to be first order in H in H, and all of this will be zeroth order in H. And on the left-hand side, I'm going to get the first order change in the separation vector uh, due to that H. So we already worked out uh, this mu nu rho sigma. It's equal to one half H mu sigma nu rho minus H nu sigma mu rho minus H rho nu mu sigma plus H rho mu nu sigma. And in uh, TT gauge, where um, H zero mu equals zero, there are no zero components of H mu nu, we, uh, you see, if, if u nu only has a zero component, the spatial components are zeros, then all I'm going to need is R with two zeros down here. So the only, only thing I need is R mu zero zero sigma, because the only u zero is non-zero, and uh, this is equal to one half. So I just need to look at these terms and see if they have any zero indices on the h, and if they do, then they must be zero. So the only non-zero term is actually um, the first one, h mu sigma zero, zero, okay, because nu is zero and rho is zero, so this is zero, this is zero, and this is zero. Okay, so what we get is that d2si dt squared is equal to one-half hij comma zero zero times sj. The separation vector, the change in the separation vector is given by the uh, gravitational wave times the separation vector. So uh, let's uh, first do our gravitational waves, and then I'm going to point out something peculiar about this equation, which, uh, which leads to a very interesting effect if, uh, discovered by Christodoulou, who's a famous uh, uh, GR expert. Um, you see, it's a little bit weird. The forcing term on the right-hand side involves a second time derivative of something. It's not a force, as we usually think about it, right? It's a, a second time derivative of something. And uh, uh, that leads to a consequence, which is called, uh, I think, it, I call it the Christodoulou effect, um, which, uh, which is quite interesting. But before we do that, and for some reason the textbooks overlook this, don't know why, but, uh, but it's actually a very interesting effect. Um, let's take our uh, TT gauge gravitational waves, G waves, uh, and we're going to take uh, in the Z direction. Okay, so just as before, assuming the uh, momentum is in the Z direction, then Hij is equal to just this two by two matrix, H plus minus H plus HX HX. Um, times E to the I K dot X. 
Now let me just be careful. How did I? Yeah, I define them as epsilon. Maybe I'll call them epsilons just to make clear their constants. Okay, so the only quantity that depends on uh, space-time is that quantity. And furthermore, um, uh, in, this, in solving this equation, we can just take x equals 0. We can take a spatial coordinate x to be 0. In other words, I'll just pick coordinates so that the, the particle I'm ca calculating the deviation from is at the origin. Right, so there's some other particle. There's particle at the origin. It's another particle, and I'm just made, and the location of the other particle is given by s, this vector s, and uh, so I can actually set this argument, the spatial part of it, to zero, for the purposes of integrating uh, that equation. There's there's nothing involving x in that equation, and so let's see what happens when I plug this into that equation. So first. Assume only epsilon plus is non-zero. Okay, so that's uh, one of the two polar linear polarizations of the gravitational wave. And then this equation, um, star, let's call that star. So star becomes... Um, S1 double dot equals minus k squared over 2 because I've got to differentiate my h twice with respect to time. And uh, h goes like this, which is e to the i k naught uh, t with a minus sign. Okay, so differentiate that twice with respect to t. I get a minus k squared. I get the half. I get um, uh, epsilon plus. And, uh, and then I get um, um, e to the minus i k t. Um, and, of course, what I should do is add the complex conjugate to h, because h is really a real thing. Um, and so, for example, if epsilon, yeah, good enough. I mean, epsilon is a complex number, so that can contribute, of course, to the phase of the wave. But uh, uh, this, is, this is the right expression for S1. Uh, the solution, uh, sorry, I left out the S1. Uh, now, when you solve this equation, you see this guy, this is small. Epsilon plus is small. So what you want to do is take S1 to lowest order on the right-hand side, which is just some number, S1 of 0. So S1 of t is equal to the solution to this equation, where S1 of 0 is a constant. Sorry, S... Uh, S let me write it down, and then I'll explain it. Uh, S1 is equal to S1 of 0. That's what it is to 0th order times 1 plus um, uh, plus, yes, plus um, epsilon plus over 2 uh, e to the minus i k t plus complex conjugate. Okay, why is that true? Well, um, on the right-hand side, I just need to use the zeroth order expression for S1. So on the right-hand side, I literally just have a uh, constant, because this is already, uh, th this stuff is first order. And then I integrate this up. So let's just check if it works. Put this into there. The double dot term, all I get is the double dot of this, which is minus i k squared over 2. And I get uh, uh, multiplied by S1, 0, which is the value of S1 at time 0. Uh, well, actually, it's not the value of S1 at time 0. It's a constant. Okay. Constant. S1, 0. So let's say, uh, take this to 0th order. 
fit the belly or it's um It's a constant, all right? Uh, it's just a constant. It's the, it's the zeroth order solution. Um, so, okay, so that's the solution for S1, and likewise, S2 obeys exactly the same uh, equation. So S2 is S2, zero, times one. But the difference is that S2 is sourced by this guy, and I should have put a minus in here and not a minus there. You should have caught that. Uh, so this is one minus epsilon plus over two e to the minus i k t plus complex conjugate. Um, so that's what the plus waves look like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so for differentiate, I just ignore this term. Pull and minus i k out of that term. I put positive i k out of the next term. No, no, I, I, I take it term by term. It's a linear sum. Yeah, yeah. So pull minus i k out of that term. I get minus i k times minus i k gives me minus k squared. No, no. If I just if I just differentiate it once. Yeah. And then sub in t equals zero, everything cancels. Uh, this one and that one cancel. Yeah, yeah it's because I, um, uh, they don't quite, actually. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because this is complex conjugate, right? So this is epsilon plus star over two e to the i k t. Okay, so when you think of this as being real, then of course it's a cosine and the dot vanishes at t equals zero. But if I make this not real, I can shift the phase of the cosine. So, yeah, I haven't gone into that. <clears throat> and in fact, in Carroll's book, he's really pretty cavalier about all of this, and all of his equations are complex, and they don't really make any sense. But it's a very good book. Um, I'm going to tell you something which isn't in his book in a moment. Um, I, I do recommend, by the way, the section on gravitational waves in Carroll's book is, uh, is pretty good. seems to be better than other books. Um, <clears throat> What's that? He might be watching you. Uh, I don't, don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> he's a blogger. He's a blogger, so he's used to uh, free, free-floating criticism. Um, okay, so that is S, that's uh, epsilon plus is non-zero. So let's uh, next assume epsilon cross is non-zero. Okay, and in this case, you find that the S1 double dot is now sourced by the S2, okay, because the metric is off-diagonal. So S1 is sourced by S2, and S2 is sourced by S1. And so what this leads to is that um, S1 of t is S2 of zero, S2, zero, so, and again, a, a constant, times 1 plus uh, epsilon cross over 2 e to the minus i k t plus conju complex conjugate and um, s uh, 2 of t is equal to s 1 0 um, times 1 plus epsilon x over 2 e to the minus i k t plus complex conjugate. So we can draw pictures of these two waves. As follows. 
So what you're supposed to imagine is a ring of test particles. Um, and we'll choose this ring uh, to lie in the xy plane. So ring of test particles. So let's choose them to lie along, along this ring. Like that. And then the gravitational wave is going to come along uh, into, let's say, into the blackboard. And we want to know what's its, what's its effect on this ring. So the H uh, plus causes the ring to do the following. It starts uh, circular, but, um, but then uh, it's stretched in one direction. Well, let me just draw it, the stretched version. Okay, so basically it's stretched, it's stretched up and down. It's compressed side to side. And then it vibrate, then it uh, oscillates back to a circle. And then it goes side to side. So when it comes back, it's going down, down, out, out. And so the, the H plus um, stretches space in one direction, squishes it in the other, and the, the stretching and compressing oscillates back and forth. Okay, the HX, so this is, I guess let me write it this way. The HX takes the circle and it um, does the same thing, but in the diagonal direction. So it will squish it this way, expand it that way, and then uh, come back to circle, and now squish it in the diagonal, and expand it that way. And so it goes like this. And it's also interesting to think about what circular polarization. And as you might imagine, the reason it's called circular polarization is that it, it, uh, it stretches in one direction. It, so circularly polarized wave stretches the ring in one direction. Uh, all of it is, it never takes the ring back to circular form. It stretches it in one direction, and the stretch direction rotates around. Okay, so it goes to this, it goes to this, just rotates like a solid body. No, oh, I didn't draw that very well. Okay, so it just rotates the ellipse like a solid body. And that's what uh, circularly polarized electromagnetic waves do as well. If you sit at one point in space, the electric field just rotates uh, with the same strength uh, at all times. And by the way, this is like uh, string theory. In string theory... Um, so actually, uh, Carroll does mention this in his book, but I think he says it wrong. Uh, in string theory, um, a photon is represented, a mu is represented by a spinning piece of string with uh, two ends. Okay, so this is open strings represent photons. And open strings, the ends of the string have to move with the speed of light. That's a boundary condition that follows from the variational principle for open strings. And so basically you have this rod, which you have this rod which has to spin 
okay, one way or the other way. And in string theory, the motion of the string has to be perpendicular to its length, to, uh, yeah, to the tangent vector along the string. So a photon is a spinning piece of string which moves at the speed of light, and it spins either clockwise or anticlockwise around its direction of propagation. And those are the two polarizations of a photon in string theory, going this way or that way. Uh, so that's a photon. The uh, graviton, okay, t tell me what a graviton is. A graviton is, in string theory, is, is, is an excitation of a closed string. It doesn't have any ends. So how can I make a closed string out of an open string? You should know this. <laughs> Stick the ends together, right? So what I do is I take two photons and I just glue them at their ends. And that's a closed string. And what it does, it's got to move at the speed of light. So this is an open string. This is a closed string. And it's a graviton. And if this is spin one, that's obviously spin two. <laughs> it's literally two photons, which are glued together end to end. Okay, that's what a graviton is in string theory. Um, okay, I said I would tell you about a, a nice effect of this equation. This equation up there. So this uh, Christodoulou effect. Now Christodoulou is a mathematician who writes tomes, okay? So uh, he has managed to prove all kinds of theorems, existence theorems for solutions of the Einstein equations, but his work is very, very hard to read for a physicist, certainly, and I suspect also for mathematicians. It's to do with existence of solutions to PDEs, blah, blah, blah. He discovered uh, an effect with which, with hindsight, is completely obvious, and I don't know why it wasn't discussed earlier. It's just my own ignorance. But he was very excited about this effect, but it's, it's completely obvious from that equation star. Um, Christodoulou effect. If a pulsed if a pulse of gravitational radiation um, uh, um, pa uh, passes let's say, impinges, I'm sorry to use an obscure word, impinges on a particle, <laughs> okay? Uh, then, so we have, we're particle sitting here, the gravitational wave comes past. Um, the effect on the particle from there is that d2si dt squared Uh, so, well, I can integrate that uh, formula. So S, the change in the separation, will go like the double integral of, um, of this uh, Si times H. Um, uh, let me just see. Yeah, let me let me just say um, it can impart a net uh, momentum to the particle. 
leaving the displacement growing linearly in T. Okay, so when you look at that equation carefully and you work out the right hand, si the right hand side, this particle is feeling a force, okay, and there's nothing in GR which forces the in time integral of that force to be zero. And if the time integral is not zero, what happens is the particle after the wave passes has a net velocity. And uh, so, uh, so this, is, this is a non-vibrating term in the solution of the geodesic deviation equation. And that term uh, can be created by gravitational waves. In the start equation, you've got a superscript dye or subscript dye, so something's happening. Say again. In the start equation, you've got a superscript dye or subscript dye, so something's happening. Oh, yeah. Um, I haven't been careful because that is to, you know, to lowest order. Uh, let's see, it was up there, it was up here. I mean, it doesn't really matter. The spatial indices up and down don't really matter because it's just delta. So if you want me to put it up, I can put it up. It doesn't make any difference. Okay. But for a pulse of gravitational waves, in general, the time integral of the pulse at a fixed location in space is not zero. And as this pulse passes, the particle ends up uh, moving away. And... Um, so that's, that's an interesting effect, and, and the net momentum acquired by the particle is um, a signature of the shape of the, of the pulse. So there's a sort of extra effect in uh, GR uh, above what you get with um, electromagnetism. Are there any, uh, any questions? Wait a minute. Oh, all right, so you're saying the gravitational radiation doesn't change and it's still in parts that momentum? How is this any different from like his... No, it's true. A particle can also impart uh, momentum. Uh, sorry, a photon can also impart momentum. It's true. Actually, I think the, the, that's not, uh, that's not uh, different. Um, yeah, it's a good question. There is some difference in the two cases. I... I don't remember precisely what it is. But in principle, there's no reason why a wave can't impart momentum. Is the gravitational wave like, does it, does it lose momentum as a result? I mean, it must. Yes. So, it has yes. To. so this it has to. you can think about this like it's the you know, normal, like, yes. jet diagram. Yes. The final diagram. Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. Is the momentum in the direction of the propagation of the wave? Uh, yes. yes, it would be. I mean, the change in the particle's momentum right. would be, yeah. So why is it so hard to, to pay attention to this effect? Uh, because the H is so tiny. <laughs> okay, so the kind of H which uh, LIGO is, uh, is trying to detect, is designed to detect H's down to 10 to the minus 20. Okay, so it, it really is a tiny effect. And even if you give the particle a kick, um, it's, uh, uh, it's a kick of that order. So it's, uh, it's really very, very hard to detect. Even though LIGO is one kilometer, kilometer long, it's trying to detect displacements, which are, you know, 10 to the minus 17 of a meter. It's much, much smaller than an atomic nucleus. I mean, that's one hundredth the size of a nucleus. You could say, how on earth do they detect lengths so small? And they do it by averaging, because it's a big object. And so even though the position of any nucleus could never be measured to that accuracy, when you average over you know, billions of nuclei, the average position can be, let, can be measured to that accuracy. And they're all moving the same way. Can you, can you make such a setting that, that you can be sure that whatever we detect that displacement 
it's a do do variation only. It's like, you know. No, you can't. I mean, the vibrations and all yeah. kinds of other things. Yeah, they have. They've been working on this for 20 years <laughs> or longer, actually, since the 1960s. The first claim of detection of gravitational waves was in the mid 60s by Joe Weber, and he made a big, big metal bar. Uh-huh. And he claimed the length of the bar was vibrating due to gravitational waves. Uh, it's a bit like bicep. <laughs> you know, but it was the beginning. I mean, there's a plus and a minus. He started the field, right? He got everyone excited. So everyone else started chasing for the same uh, signal. And uh, they used better experiments, and they find it, found it wasn't there. Uh, but the experiments got better and better and better, and we hope that in five years' time they will find the gravitational waves. Okay, but it takes a long time. I mean, this is, you know, almost, uh, we, we will see gravitational waves sort of uh, almost 50 years after that first claim. Uh, so it's good, it's good to get everyone excited, but one should bear in mind that the first, cl- first claim detection is not always right. And, you know, in the case of bicep, it's a considerably bigger claim. Because <laughs> Joe Weber knew that there are black holes and neutron stars. and Well, he actually didn't know about black holes, but he knew that there were neutron stars and uh, objects running around the universe. They almost certainly give gravitational waves. So his claim was pretty modest. Uh, to claim to see the Big Bang at, you know, 10 to the minus 30 seconds uh, is a very big claim. The amazing thing is that the, by and large, the physics community bought it. (laughs) Uh, People were amazingly uh, accepting and uncritical. Um, It's a problem. People seem to have lost their uh, ability to (laughs) question. (laughs) So anyway, science is self-correcting, luckily. Uh, That's what I was sending my email. I was sending my email to The Economist magazine who's interested in the bicep. What does it mean? Has it all gone? And all that stuff. So, yes, it's all gone. (laughs) (laughs) Any, Any other questions? Okay, so our next lecture we will uh, fall into a black hole.